Oh, good evening, everyone. Welcome to our service this evening. Thank you, Andrew, for taking the service this evening. Service this week continue on Tuesday with a Bible study at 7.30, which my dad will be taking. And on Wednesday morning, coffee morning at 10, and two clubs of the children, 5.30 and 6.30 Wednesday evening. And the church elders, or church elders meeting on Friday at 7.30. Next Sunday morning begins at 10.15 with prayer meeting. At 11 o'clock in the morning, we'll be taking on morning service. And of course, around the house at 2.30 in the afternoon. And then 6.30 in the evening, Andrew again will be taking evening service. Let's pray for God's blessing on those services in this coming week. To remember the prison and Bible study on Monday afternoon, and also testaments being sent to Kingsdown School, Warminster, and Wells Blue School Cathedral School at Wells this week. Let's pray for those children that they will get these testaments, that they will read them, and that God's word will speak into their hearts and their lives. Also, it's been circulated, some of you will already received one this morning, there are some around at the back you haven't been given one, but it's an update sheet from Carrie, who's back for a moment, for a while, for a bit of a refreshing break for her work, and there's an update on their report of what's been going on, and the translation work she's been involved in, so if you haven't got one, please take one, and please remember, especially in your prayers at this time. Thank you. Hymn number 314, 314. Rejoice, the Lord is King, your Lord and King adore. Mortals give thanks and sing, and triumph evermore. 314, stand to sing. Right. 
Dear Lord and Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity tonight to meet together, to praise and to worship you. We thank you once again we can find ourselves here. And Lord, as we pray before you, we stop for a moment and realise that you are the great almighty God, the wonderful creator, the one who wonderfully and fearfully made us, the one who sustains us. We thank you that you are a God of love. We thank you that you loved us before we even knew you. You realise that you are a just and holy God. As we bear before you, we confess that even over the last days we've done things wrong in your sight. We confess that we've gone our own way, we've done our own thing, we've turned our back on you. And although you are a just and holy God, a God who can look upon sin, we thank you that you loved us so much that you sent your Son into this world. We thank you that Jesus came. We thank you that he took on human form. We thank you that he lived his life perfectly here. Everything he did pleased you. We thank you that he came for one purpose. He was to die upon a cross. We thank you he bore our sins upon his body. We thank you he died in our place for the punishment we deserve for our sin. We thank you tonight if we know of him as our Lord and our Saviour. We have joy of knowing sins forgiven. You look down upon us tonight and you see us pure and spotless. I would pray tonight there's anybody here that has never opened their heart to receive you as Saviour. But they see the need of you tonight. And we ask and pray that before they leave this place, you will make sure they are right with you. Thank you for the promises in your word that where your people are gathered, that you will be with them. We pray that you will be here with us. Help us, we pray, as we read your word, to understand those things we read. And as we go before you, we realise you know our hearts and our minds, you know exactly what sort of message we need this evening. And we pray that you meet every need. May each and every one of us go away from this place rejoicing that we've been together, most of all because you have spoken to us. Speak to us, we pray, from your word. As we pray this ourselves, we think of many of us meeting the same way as us, in our country and even throughout the world, we pray the word will go forth with power. For those who have already met today, we pray it has gone forth with power. But even today, there have been those who have found salvation in Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. So be with us, we pray. Bless us. We pray for those who are not here, for whatever reason, and Lord, we pray that you'll be with them wherever they are. Those who are not well, those who are away, and those who don't know why they're not here, and Lord, we pray that you will bless them. We pray that all that takes place in this service will bring honour and glory to your name. For we ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Our first reading is going to be Matthew chapter 14, verses 22 to 32. In Church Bibles, page 931. 931. I've actually got the wrong numbers down there, it's up to verse 33. So it's not 32, it's 33. So it's Matthew chapter 14, 22 to 33. Immediately, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side, while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. And when evening came, he was alone there. But the boat was now in the middle of the sea. 
tossed by the waves, for the wind was contrary. Now in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went out to them, walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a ghost. And they cried out of fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I, do not be afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. And he said, Come. And when Peter had come out of, down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him, and said to him, O oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. And those who were in the boat came and worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. So we've got hymn books, we've seen our second hymn, which is 524, 524. For Christ in thee my soul hath found, and found in thee alone, the peace, the joy I sought so long, the bliss till now unknown. Now none but Christ can satisfy, no other name for me. There's love and life and lasting joy, Lord Jesus found in me. 524. <laughs> Few things up there carries 
uh, prayer sheet and our prayers. Day for your diaries, the 9th of, Tuesday the 9th of July. Harry's going to come along on the Bible study evening and tell us a little bit more about the work. And also in our prayers, remember those testaments going out to the three schools this week, King Down School, Blue School Wells and Cathedral School Wells on Tuesday. Let's pray for those Bibles. And in our prayers, we also remember Josh Tarlin, who's should have been here this morning, so we remember him also. So let's come before God again and pray us prayer. We thank you, dear Lord, for this opportunity of prayer. As we pray before you again, we have many things upon our hearts, many things upon our minds. We think of those in the fellowship here who are not very well, those who are waiting for doctor's appointments and hospital appointments and Lord we pray that you'll be with them. As we pray before you look around the world, we see it's a troubled world, we see it's a broken world. Again we think of countries caught up by war. And again we plead for peace. We think today of people who be sad and sorrowful at loss of loved ones through fighting and through wars. And through other disasters, and Lord, we ask that you be the God of comfort. We look around the world and we see there's places where people are hungry, where there's no food. We pray for those who are seeking to take help and aid for it to be quiet. We need those who have been caught up in areas of floods and other disasters, and Lord, again, we ask and pray that the help will get to them what they need this time. We thank you for news from Carrie. We thank you that she's safely back home for this short spell. We thank you for the way you've been with her over many years. And we think of the team still out there in Indonesia. We pray for Lily and Dave, particularly at this time, who are not very well. We pray that for their children, Joshua and Zach, we ask and pray that they will be kept from this disease. And Lord, we pray that you are healed. No man and God at this time. We thank you for the way the work has gone on in that country and how it's now spread into other islands in Indonesia. We thank you that people can read the word of God in their language, which they can understand. We thank you, your words are powerful words. The word which can change hearts. And we pray those testaments will be taken, they'll be read through reading your word at last we change. We think in this area, those testaments going out on Tuesday to those three schools. And we pray that the youngsters will take that word. They will read it. We ask and pray that you will give them understanding of the things they read. We pray for Josh Tarlin tonight. We ask the Lord that you'll be close to him. We pray that you help him in this time of uncertainty. We pray, dear Lord, that you will open and close those doors, that he will go to that work which you have for him to do. We ask and pray that you'll be close to him and bless him. We thank you for the message this morning from Alan. We pray even now that that seed has been sown into hearts. That seed will grow. That seed will produce a fruit for you. We pray for ourselves now as we turn to your word. That you'll speak to us from it. Do us good, we pray. For we ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. want to split our thoughts up into two parts. As I said last week and five of the next six weeks, including last week, we're looking at weather-related themes from the Bible. And tonight we're going to be looking at storms. Last week we considered how we can impact people in our lives, either good or for bad. My prediction for each one of us is there will be storms ahead. 
So if you're going today excited, but there will be storms ahead. Do you ever feel like life is cruising along? Your family is healthy, work is good, retirement is good, friends are good. There's no real stress in your life. All seems to be really, really good. You feel good about your life. You've got no cares, you've got no worries. Even through town and winning some of their, their own football games and you're having a good time. And then out of nowhere, suddenly this. It's the absolutely most imperfect storm imaginable. And it's your storm. You didn't ask for it, you didn't want it, but somehow that storm found you. It didn't ask for your permission. It didn't ask if this was the right time. It just came like a guided missile with your name on it, and it hit. <clears throat> Tonight our thoughts, the title of our thoughts is Into the Storm. We're going to look at storms. We're going to look at our reaction from a couple of different angles to see how we can make it through those tough times. We've been there before, haven't we? We look at the Lord and we cry out, Lord, this is ridic getting ridiculous. We've all been there at one time or another, and we felt that we've had more than our fair share. There was a cartoon a few years ago about Charlie Brown, who builds the most beautiful sandcastle. He has worked on it for many hours. Finally, he stands back, he looks at it, it's wonderful. And just as he's singing and he's admiring it, a person comes by and knocks over his masterpiece. Now he's standing where his beautiful castle was, now level sand. And he's wondering, I know there's a lesson in this, but I'm not sure what it is. Every one of us has had our sandcastles blown over. Every once in a while we back up and we say, why am I being hit with this storm of life? And like Charlie Brown, we wonder, I know there's a lesson in this, but I'm not sure what it is. Sometimes these storms are caused by the devil sometimes by other people, sometimes even by ourselves. Sometimes they are allowed by the Lord God. They come from different sources, but they do have a purpose in our lives. One of the most difficult things during a storm is to consider what does God want me to learn from this storm. And with that in mind, I want us to look at those verses we read from Matthew chapter 14. It's a world, it's a crazy time in Jesus' life here on earth. He's going through the highs and lows of living life, of living a life just like me and you. You see, Matthew 14 opens with the beheading of John the Baptist. By King Herod. And Jesus is upset. If you remember, John was his cousin. They were the same age. They most likely played together quite a bit when they were growing up. And we see that Jesus wants to withdraw to a quiet place. He wants a time to reflect, he wants a time to pray. But when he does withdraw to a quiet place, crowds follow him. And there are so many. He begins to heal people. We have that great miracle of five loaves and two fish feeding thousands and thousands of people. 
And then this happens. Verse 22. Immediately Jesus made the disciples get into the boat to go before him to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, Jesus went out onto the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But the boat by this time was a long way from the land, beaten by the waves, for the wind was against them. And in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified. They said, it's a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. Since we're only looking at really the storms we pass over the bit tonight of Peter walking on the water, and perhaps we'll look at that another time. What I really want us to do tonight is to look at the fact that storms happen in our lives. And you may be thinking, if you're sitting there, really? Tell me something I don't know. Yet more often than not, we don't think storms should hit us. We say we are good people. We attend church. We read the Bible. We pray. We try to do good. We give our money. We give our time. We serve. And yes, we're sinners, and that's why we have Jesus. So we think, this shouldn't be happening to me. So the first thing I want to tell you is that everyone has storms. In fact, for many of you, the storm clouds may have already gathered. You're trying to figure out what is going to be your game plan. For some of you, you may be in the worst storm of your life. And the reasons for those storms, they do vary. I want us to realise that everyone has them, no one is immune. Jesus says this in Matthew chapter 5, verse 45. For God makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. The sun rises on the good and evil. It rains and waters the fields of those who do good and those who do wrong. Storms, problems, difficulties, trials, you pick any of the words, they come to us all. There's no exclusion. Just because we are a Christian, because, just because we follow Jesus Christ doesn't mean we're going to be excluded from those storms of life. Now some of those storms come because we are out of God's will. An example of that is the man Jonah. He did deliberately disobey God's direction. And because of that, God sent a great wind and a storm on the boat, with Jonah ended up in the belly of a huge fish. Another example we find in 1 Corinthians 11, when Paul is talking to the church about how some of them took communion in an unworthy manner. And he wrote, For this cause many are weak and sick among you, and even some will die. Another example we find in Acts chapter 5, Ananias and Sapphira delivery lied to God and to the church concerning their giving, and they lost their life. The storm you could be in now may be because of your disobedience. But that's just one possibility. Some storms come because we are in God's will. <clears throat> just because we've encountered a storm in life does, doesn't necessarily mean that you're out of the will of God or being punished. Did you notice the first verse we read in that reading tonight, verse 22? We read, immediately Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. In other words, the idea of the word made is that Jesus forced or compelled with great urgency for those disciples to get into the boat. 
these guys were fishermen. And they were scared when they were in that boat in the middle of that lake. And that's not good news. Jesus knew what was going to happen. He wanted to see how they would react. And here they are in the midst of the storm. But Jesus is the one who has put them in that boat. He's the one that told them to get out into the middle of the lake. They're right in the middle of God's will. But they're still having the storm of life. And the thing is, when they left the shore, they had no clue that storm clouds were brewing. Another example we could look at is the man Job. God said this about Job, that he was blameless and upright. One who feared God, one who turned away from evil. Wouldn't it be great if God says that about you and me, wouldn't it? Nobody else in the Bible was described in those words. Yet we know all about the devastating losses he suffers, the boils from head to toe that Job had to endure as he sat on that ash heap. Had he sinned? No, he hadn't. He was faithful. He was a great man in God's sight. And yet he was still going through the storm of life. Joseph was another example. A shining star in God's kingdom. And yet we see Joseph being sold into slavery by his brothers. He spends years in prison because he was slandered by the wife of Potiphar. Joseph is in the middle of a terrible storm, yet he is in the centre of God's will. The Apostle Paul went through a shipwreck. We'll look at that later on. He was imprisoned, he was beaten. He died a martyr's death. Yet he was a man of God. He was a great leader in the early church. He's in the centre of God's will. What I'm saying is that it's possible for you to obey God, to be faithful, to walk in his ways, being right in the centre of his will, and yet at the same time encounter those terrible storms. I want to share that with you because I know so many people who really love God, who try to serve and obey him, and yet because of life's uncertainties, and because of sin, life gives them a tough blow. When we have that difficult time, we have to have our feet on the ground. We need to understand that storms happen to people in the will of, will of God, as well as outside of his will. I want to end this part of our message with a some words of reassurance that no matter what you've gone through, no matter what you are going through, or no matter what you will go through, God has promised that he will not abandon you. He will not fail you. He will not forsake you. We read in Hebrews chapter 7 verse 23, Now there are many, there have been many of those priests since death prevented them from continuing office, but because Jesus lives forever, he has a permanent priesthood. Therefore he is able to save completely those who come to God through him, because he always lives to intercede for them. Mm. Isn't that great? Mm. Jesus lives to intercede for us. Whatever your storm, Jesus is there. He has not given up on you. In fact, he may have something great just around the corner. We just need to get there. We know he loves us. We know he's died for us. He has great plans for us too. It's a plan which may not make any sense to us at the moment. Yet it is a plan to bring good in our lives. Jeremiah wrote in Jeremiah 29 verse 11, 
For I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Let's sing our next hymn and we'll look at one of a story about storms and God's work. Our next hymn is 568. Will your anchor hold in the storms of life, when the clouds unfold their wings of strife, when the strong tides lift and the cables strain? Will your anchor drift or firm remain? 568. <laughs> Chapter 27, Church Bible, page number 1072. Acts chapter 27, we're reading verses 1 to 26 in a few moments. As we continue to look at weather related instances in the Bible, we're going to follow Paul as he's being taken to Rome. The ship that he was to get on got into a storm and things got pretty rough for everyone on that ship. And this passage teaches us some things about storms. A young man, Michael, tells this story. My uncle Roger and I both consider ourselves to be very good fishermen. If you didn't believe it, you could just ask uncle Roger and he would say, trust me, I know. I have many fishing stories about uncle Roger. Most of them are probably exaggerated a bit, but the one thing I know is that when we went fishing together, something crazy seemed to happen almost every time. Michael says when he was in college, he went to see his grandparents and Uncle Roger. 
And Uncle Roger decided that they would go fishing on a very large lake. Michael says, you must understand that my uncle had this special little island that we would go to in the middle of his lake, and the boat that would take us there was an eight foot long aluminium boat. We went to this island and we started fishing. And while we were fishing, we noticed that the clouds were building up around the mountains, and it seemed to be moving in our direction, but not very quickly. So we continued to fish. All of a sudden, we noticed that about 20 feet in front of us, a storm that looked like a black wall was coming very quickly. We were in a bit of a bind. We knew we didn't have time to leave the island and get across the lake back safely. We also knew this island had no place of safety to hide. We simply weren't prepared for a storm. And almost immediately the wind began to blow, the lightning was striking all around, hailstones the size of golf balls were hitting us in the head. And even the island we were standing on was getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And I remember thinking, this is it. This is the day I will die. Hoping that my Uncle Roger would know what to do, I said, what do we do? And his reply was, turn the boat upside down and let's get underneath it. I have to tell you, getting underneath an aluminium boat during a lightning storm, sitting in water up to your chest is not the best plan. <laughs> and that's what we did, and we survived. Since then, Michael says, when I go fishing, I'm prepared for a storm. With that in mind, I want us to look at going through the storms of life and how we as Christians should deal with them. Let's read the first 12 verses of Acts 27. When it was decided that we should sail to Italy, they delivered Paul and some of the other prisoners to one named Julius, a centurion of the Augustan regiment. So entering a ship of the Armadillion, I can press this word all afternoon, I can't get it out. Armadillion, we put to sea, meaning to sail along the coast of Asia. Aristarchus, a, a Macedonian of Thessalonica, was with us. And the next day we landed at Sidon. And Julius treated Paul kindly gave him liberty to go to his friends and receive care. When he had put to sea from there, we sailed under the shelter of Cyprus, because the wind was were contrary. And when we had sailed over the sea, which is off uh, Sicilia and Pamphylia, we came to Myra, a city of Lycia. Then the centurion found an Alexandrian ship, sailing to Italy, and he put us on board. When we had sailed slowly many days and arrived with difficulty off Nidus, the wind not permitting us to proceed, we sailed under the shelter of Crete, off Salome. Passing it with difficulty, we came to a place called Fair Havens, near the city of Lassia. There were much time being spent, and sailing was now dangerous because of the fast was already over. Paul advised them, saying, Men, I perceive that this voyage will end with disaster and much loss, not only of cargo and the ship, but also of our lives. Nevertheless, the centurion was more persuaded by the helmsman and the owner of the ship and by the things spoken by Paul. And because the harbour was not suitable to winter in, the majority advised to set sail from there also, if by any means they could reach Phoenix, a harbour of Crete, open towards the southwest and the northwest, and to winter there. First thing I want us to remember tonight is that storms are out of our control. Paul was given over to a centurion, 
and put him and the other prisoners on a ship. The trip was difficult because it was the wrong time of the year to be travelling in that area. Paul explained to them it was a bad idea to keep going, but Paul's warnings were not listened to. Regardless of what was going to happen, Paul had no control over that situation. There are many times that we end up in a storm because of bad choices, bad decisions. Sometimes those bad decisions are ours, sometimes they are made by someone else. Either way, once you are in a storm, you are in the storm. How you weather the storm shows who you are. How you weather the storm shows who you trust. Let's continue reading verse 13. When the south wind blew softly, supposing that they have obtained their desire, putting out to sea, they sailed close by Crete. But not long after, a tempestuous headwind arose called Eurycloden. So when the ship was caught and could not head into the wind, we let her drive. And running under the shelter of an island called Claudia, we secured the skiff with difficulty. When they had taken it on board, they used cables to undergird the ship. And fearing lest they should run aground on the Cyrus sands, they struck sail and so were driven. And because we were exceedingly tempest tossed, the next day they lightened the ship. On the third day, we threw the ship's tackle overboard with our own hands. There were neither sun nor stars up here for many days. And no small tempest beat upon us. All hope that we would be saved was finally given up. First thing we remember is that storms are out of our control. Second thing we can think on, that storms can make us desperate. The pilot of the ship decided that the wind was just right for them to leave. It wasn't long before the wind was out of control. The ship was being thrown back and forth. At that point, the men started to become desperate. They tried to figure out things on their own. We need to notice the actions they took because there is a spiritual equivalence to them. The first thing they tried to do, they tried to secure the skiff, the lifeboat, that was not secure. They hoisted it into the ship. They were not sure what was going to happen but they started to look for a way to save themselves, and that's human nature. Secondly, they tried to hold everything together on their own. They started to pass ropes and cables underneath the ship to hold the ship together. How often during a storm do we start trying to hold it all together with our own power? Thirdly, they tried to stay in place. Their new plan, their new strategy was to lower the anchor and be held in place. But unfortunately, this plan did not work. They were dragged around, but held in place enough that the ship was battered from the storm. Trying to hide from a storm usually ends up that we are more damaged even more. They tried to get rid of the extra baggage. When all else fails, they start trying to get rid of stuff. Have you ever made deals with God? God, if you will rescue me from this storm, I will get rid of that sinful thing. After all of their desperate attempts to save themselves did not work, they gave up. They gave up all hope of being saved on the third day. Let's read on from verse 21. But after a long abstinence from food, then Paul stood in the midst of them and said, Men, you should have listened to me, and not have sailed from Crete, and incurred this disaster and loss. Now I urge you to take heart, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. 
for there stood by me this night an angel of God, to whom I belong and whom I serve, saying, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must be brought before Caesar, and indeed God has granted you all those who sail with you. Therefore take heart, men, for I believe God, that it will be just as he has told me. However, we must run aground on a certain island. Remember that storm in the storms we are they are out of our control. They can make us desperate. But they can draw us closer to God. Just when it seems like it is all over, God can change everything in a moment. Everyone was hungry and starving, and Paul was telling them almost like, I told you so. And that didn't help. But then he tells them not to be discouraged because no one was going to die. He shared with them that an angel of God stood beside him and told him they would not die. God's plan was not to complete in Paul's life yet. You must remember to call upon God before the storm, during the storm and after the storm. Notice that although they were told that they were all going to be saved, they still were going to crash. Storms will happen in our lives many times. It's not if, but when. When storms are raging in your life, you need to choose to draw closer to God. Somebody made this statement, I couldn't find out who it was. He's the same God who will deliver you out of the storm, and he's the same God who will walk with you through your storm. God doesn't have to stop the storm. He can come during the storm and walk with you right on through that storm. That's good news for you. That's good news for me. God is with us, even when we're going through those storms. Let's take our hymn book and sing our last hymn. Six one seven. I serve a risen Saviour. He's in the world today. Second verse says, "In all the world around me, I see His loving care. And although my heart grows weary, I never will despair. I know that He is leading through all the stormy blasts. The day of His appearing will come at last." Six one seven.
love and peace who brought up our Lord Jesus from the dead, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood the everlasting covenant, make us complete in every good work to do his will, working in us what is well pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Amen.